Hollywood, California, Monday, January 11th. The Lux Radio Theater presents Claudette Colbert and Fred McMurray in The Gilded Lily with David Niven and George Chandler. Lux presents Hollywood. Our stars, Claudette Colbert, Fred McMurray, David Niven, and George Chandler. Our guests, Linton Wells, famous newspaper correspondent, and Janet Riesenfeld, dancer, recently returned from war-torn Spain. Our producer, Cecil B. DeMille. Our conductor, Louis Silvers. To you who crowd our theater on Hollywood Boulevard tonight, and to Lux listeners the nation over, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap extend a hearty welcome. Perhaps more so than anyone else, does a lovely screen star have to guard a beautiful complexion. Constantly before the public, she knows the camera will catch the slightest blemish should her skin reveal one. How significant it is, then, that nine out of ten screen stars use Lux toilet soap. The same beauty care so inexpensive that every girl can use it every day. Begin your Lux toilet soap beauty care tomorrow. The Lux Radio Theater presents its distinguished producer, Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Claudette Colbert has starred twice for me on the radio and three times on the screen. Highlights of our association run through my mind like sequences of film through a projector. Once I made a pass by a pair of leopards rushing dangerously close to their fangs. But I protected her in that instance by pouring perfume on the cushions where the leopards crouched. Leopards don't care for stars if they can get perfume. Then there's the story of the centipede in Hawaii. After I had told Claudette that there was nothing in the Hawaiian jungle that could possibly harm her, she sat down to find a six-inch centipede roosting in her chair. Jumping up, she forgot the fierce-looking insect in her fury at me. And going across the studio lot one day, I met her on the way to lunch. How would you like to play the role of the wickedest woman in the world, I asked her. I'd love it, said Claudette. So I cast her as Poppea in The Sign of the Cross. Later, she starred for me as history's most glamorous woman, Cleopatra. And someday, I hope to star her as the bravest woman in the world. A part I have in mind for her that she knows nothing about. But Claudette is something of a star maker herself. Three young men who have risen to prominence in the past year scored first as leading men for Miss Colbert. They are Melvin Douglas, Charles Boyer, and a frequent visitor to my set while I was shooting The Plainsman, Fred McMurray. When Paramount cast him as Claudette's leading man in The Gilded Lily, the effect of his charm was instantaneous. Everywhere, people were suddenly talking about him. A ten-letter man in high school... Fred now gets 10,000 letters a month, but he's just as regular as the man he plays tonight. Pete, a ship news reporter. Claudette Colbert, born with the name of Lily, resumes that name for the evening. David Niven will be heard in the role of Charles Gray and George Chandler as Eddie, a photographer. And this is the moment when we introduce them to the Lux Radio Theatre audience. Ladies and gentlemen... Claudette Colbert and Fred McMurray in a story based on the paramount picture, The Gilded Lily. <laughs> 42nd and 5th Avenue, New York City. From a park bench not far from the steps of the public library... Two young people are idly contemplating the surge of traffic at the busy intersection. They are Pete Dawes, a newspaper reporter, who leans back against the bench, his long legs stretched out before him, and Lily Davis, a stenographer. They haven't been talking very much, just watching and eating popcorn from a paper bag. <laughs> Big stuff, eh? Watching the world go by? Right. Big stuff. Of course, there's different ways of watching. Now you take the guy who eats peanuts. 
Every time he cracks a shell, he has to see that his thumb is in the right spot, and then he has to take the penis out and then throw the shells away. A guy like that can't concentrate. See what I mean? Oh, sure. But popcorn. Ha-ha, <laughs> popcorn was made for watching the world go by. Look, I stick my hand in the bag without taking my eyes off the street. I throw the popcorn in my craw, I chew, and I'm still looking. That's what I call class. Sure, peanut eaters don't know how to live. Nah. Tell me something, Lily. Do you love me? No. That's the way to talk. No worries, no jealousies, just meeting here every Thursday and eating our popcorn. Why don't you love me? Oh, I don't know. Maybe I don't know what love is, but I think I do. What do you think? About love? About love. Well, I think when it hits me, I'll start walking three feet off the ground, and, and if the man has a mole on his nose, I won't be able to see it. And I have a feeling that when I find him, he'll be flat broke. Right. And when you're married, you won't be able to quit your job until you have to. And there'll be plenty of reasons why you'll have to. Well, that's the fun of being married. Fun? <laughs> you'll do your own cooking and washing. You'll lose your figure. Oh, you newspaper men know everything. Sure. What you're trying to be is a Lizzie Glutz. Lizzie Glutz? Yeah. The girl who runs her own little world to suit herself because she's too unimportant to have the world run her. Oh, that sounds great to me. Mm, of course it does. The smarter you are, the harder you try for that kind of life. But Lizzie Glutz is Lizzie Glutz simply because she's too darn dumb to be anything else. And that's not you. Oh, Pete, you're talking through your nose again. Ah, there's a dame for you. I try to tell her she's got an inner to be big stuff, and what does she do? Uh, she says, let's go for a walk. <laughs> Only as far as the subway, though. I got to work tonight. Hey, is there a boat docking? Yeah. I got to get an interview with some visiting goof about what he thinks of our beautiful buildings and tall women. Oh, Pete, someday I'd like to go down and meet a boat with you. Just to see what celebrities are like, huh? Uh, if people really knew, there wouldn't be any celebrities. Well, let's go. I'll walk you to the subway. Wait a minute. Don't you think you'd better put your shoes on? <laughs> Gosh, I forgot I took them off. <laughs> You're just a grandfather. Huh? <laughs> Come on, hurry up. I don't want to miss the West Side Limited. West Side train, West Side. Let them out, let them out. There's the train, please. Same bench. Same time. So long, Lily. Right. <laughs> West Side train, keep moving in there. Don't block the doors. All right, lady, if you're going in, go on. Oh, what do you think you're shoving? I know me, job lady. There's no more room in this car. Well, then we'll make it. Go on, go on. Oh, stop it! Look here, you can't do that. You're you flattening this young lady. Oh, shut up and turn around before somebody steps in your face. Let me out of here. Go on, get in. You let her alone or I'll do a bit of pushing myself. Oh, yeah? I'd like to see you try it. I'm afraid I'll have to. Oh, hey, oh, hey, let me out of here. You better get out of here, mister. Are you all right? A wise guy, huh? Going around knocking people down. Well, I'm sorry you fell over, but this young lady's had difficulty. And oh, I... so I fell over, huh? Maybe like you're going to fall over. Oh, get him alone! Why are you... Hey, hey, get a call! Get a call! Hey. Come on, get out here before they arrest you. Arrest me, but I... Oh, don't look back, but is anybody following us? I can't see without looking. Well, let's duck into a store. A store, a store here, and this one. Oh, mister, whatever you do, never sock a subway guard. Not even for you? Well... What is it, please? No, what's what? Can I wait on you? Uh, well, no. Oh, no, we're just browsing around. Browsing? For an artificial leg? Artificial what? Well, that's all we sell in here, sir. Well, uh, <laughs> that's a lovely day, isn't it? I think so. Oh, mm. Quite well, thanks very much. Well, come on, let's get out. <laughs> well, here we are. Is this your house? Mine and about 20 other people. I've got the second floor front. Well. Well. Uh, did, did, did I thank you for the dinner? Three times. Am I going to see you again? <laughs> why not? Of course, why not? Uh, did anyone ever tell you that you talk like an Englishman? I was born in England. Ah, uh, maybe that's why. Yes, maybe that's why. Mm. Well, I don't know what I'm talking about, do you? <laughs> no, I feel as though I just come out of ether. Well. May I see you tomorrow? For what? Well, for fun. What's your name? Gray. Uh, Charles Gray. Shall I say about two? Tomorrow's Friday. Don't you work on Friday? No. Do you work on Thursday? No. Do you work any day? No. Oh. Well, why don't you go out and look for a job tomorrow? But tomorrow I want to be with you. Well, not at two o'clock. I work until 5.30. Oh, I can wait. Better still, I'll meet you in the morning and take you to your office. Will you look for a job Monday? If you'll let me see you on Saturday and Sunday, too. <laughs> well, why should I care if you find a job? Of course. Why should you care? Well, good night. 
Um, thanks for stalking the guard. No trouble. Oh, oh, but my name's Lily. Lily David. I forgot to tell you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Well, that's all there is to tell about me. I make $20 a week. It was 35 a few years ago, but I don't mind. I haven't many friends, and I don't mind that either. Now, do you want to dance? I'd rather just sit and talk, if you don't mind. Sure. Isn't it funny? We've known each other almost a week now, and this is the first time we've let down our hair and talked seriously. What about you? Me? All I know about you is your name so far. Well, there's very little else. My life story is very dull, and I wouldn't bore you with it. Are you going to keep your promise about finding a job? Why are you so interested in a job for me? Well, well it, it, it's the right way to live now, isn't it? Instead of going along from day to day, just trusting that something will come along to keep you going. That's true, I suppose. And we're going to see each other again, aren't we? So often that you'll become annoyed with me. Do you think so? No, not really. Do you want to hear a secret? About you? No, about both of us. If I were ever to become annoyed with you, it would have happened years ago. What? That's when I first started thinking about you. How you'd look, oh. the way you'd have, what you'd say when we were together. And do I live up to the picture? Perfectly. Even to being without a job. But that's the way I wanted you to be, so that when I met you, actually, I could help you. Well, there's not much I can say after that. If I simply told you I loved you, it would sound rather flat, wouldn't it? I don't think so. Shall I try it, just to see how it sounds? Will you mean it? How could I help but mean it? And try it. I love you so much. Happy? Oh, gloriously. But we shouldn't have taken a cab. <laughs> we had to celebrate. It isn't every night I tell a girl that I love her. I hope not. I'll pay half the bill. All right. And what about tomorrow? Will I see you? Oh, tomorrow and the day after and the day after that. And Oh, no, wait a minute. No, tomorrow's Thursday, isn't it? Yes, why? Oh, I, I can't see you tomorrow night. I have a date. Oh. You don't mind, do you? It's been every Thursday for such a long time. Some more popcorn, Lily? No. What's the matter? Sick? No. You know something? There's no reason why we shouldn't force the city to put a water bottle beside this bench. A man can't eat popcorn all night without drinking something. I said a man can't eat popcorn all night without drinking something. Hmm? Oh, yes. Hey, look at me. What's the matter with you tonight? Pete, I want you to shake hands with Lizzie Glutz. Lizzie Glutz? Yeah, Lizzie Glutz. The girl we talked about. The girl you said I wasn't, remember? The girl who was going to meet some man who'd sweep her right off the ground and he'd be broke and neither of them would care and... All at once, they'd be living in their own little world. Oh. So what happened, huh? Yep. Just like I said it would. You see, you were wrong. Yeah. Who is he? Just a nobody, but you'd like him. Would I? Oh, beat it's the swellest feeling. All at once, you're, you're face to face. You don't know how it happened, but there you are. And from then on, it's just one roller coaster ride after another. Wait till it happens to you. You think it will? It's bound to. What'll I do? <laughs> well. I know what I'll do. Just sit on the bench and eat my popcorn and watch the world go by. And then all at once, there won't be any more popcorn, and a man can't watch the world go by without popcorn, can he? Please. Can he? Please. I bet he's a darn nice guy. Yeah, he is a darn nice guy. I was nuts about this bench, weren't you? I still am. Well, I'll, I'll put a four-inch sign on it tomorrow. But, Pete, you're still the best friend I've got. What I do with him won't make any difference with us. No. No, you don't understand about him. I want you to meet him right away. There's no reason why the three you of us... You don't know your guys. But I don't want to lose you. I won't. I know. Just all reliable. That's how I stack up with you. All right, forget about the forensic sign. If you're ever in a spot or if you feel like you want to talk it over with somebody on a Thursday night, you'll know where to find me. I'll be here. But don't come unless you have to, because it can never be the same anymore, see? You understand that, don't you? I guess so. Well... Well, I got to beat it. Oh, no, yeah, no. Yeah, I, I got some stuff to finish up over at the office. I'll be working pretty late, I guess, so... Well, so long, Lily. So long.
In just a moment, we will continue with the Lux Radio Theater presentation of The Gilded Lily, starring Claudette Colbert and Fred McMurray. For the moment, we want to tell you a little inside story about Mr. DeMille's own studio, Paramount. Yesterday, there was a story conference. Now, as we tune in, some of the girls are still typing away at the script. Madge is particularly rushed. She and Virginia have a special date tonight with two special gentlemen, and Virginia's all ready to go. All set, Matt? Come on. Oh, Virginia, is it that late? Oh, I'm tired. Honest, I don't know how I can go out tonight. I've been digging in my files and typing like Matt all day long. Couldn't we go tomorrow night? Oh, no. I'm tired, too, but I know what to do about it. I just pop into a nice, warm, luxe toilet soap bath. Haven't you tried that? It makes you feel swell, round to go. Thousands of popular girls all over the country are in on the Lux Toilet Soap Beauty Bath Secret. Famous screen stars like Betty Davis and Carol Lombard find it a wonderful pick-me-up after a hard studio day. And most important of all, you can depend on Lux Toilet Soap's active lather to protect daintiness. Keep your skin sweet. You'll love the delicate, expensive fragrance of this fine white soap. Once again, Mr. DeMille. We continue with The Gilded Lily, starring Claudette Colbert and Fred McMurray with David Niven. A few days have passed since Lily said goodbye to the easygoing news hawk. We're in a richly furnished apartment of a Park Avenue hotel where two men stand facing each other across a table. The older man is the Duke of Loamshire, visiting America incognito. The younger is his son, known to us as Charles Gray, known in England as Lord Granville. The Duke of Loamshire breaks a long silence. So, mm-hmm, it's actually that serious, Charles. Yes, Father. Well, and now what? Well, first I'll have to cable Helen and ask her to break the engagement. Well, that's going to be rather difficult. I know. And this, uh, this Lily? Well, I'll simply tell her that fate takes care of idiots and supplies them well with money, and, and I'll take her back to England and we'll be married. And that's that. Well, I... Gray, why did you lie about yourself to this girl? Tell her that you were a nobody, that you had no money. I didn't. She told me that about myself. And after that, I was afraid to tell her the truth, because... Because you wanted to be what she thought you were. Yes, Oh, that's human, I suppose. But uh, <laughs> you'll forgive me, of course, if my mouth seems to hang open at times. Why, back home you were so enthused about social things. Parties, clubs, and all that. And here, all at once, you plunge yourself into a terrible, serious romance with this, uh, this shop girl. She's not a shop girl. She works in an office. Oh, uh, forgive me. But I, I still can't understand it. But don't you see, I asked that we make this trip to America secretly just to get away from all that social nonsense. Uh, for how long? Oh, I'm sincere about this, Father. Oh, of course you are. You're sincere about everything uh, for the moment. But well, that's your way of objecting to Lily. I don't object to her, Gray. If you're set on marrying Lily, I'll accept her. And so will Mother. But there are various ways of handling a delicate situation, and you're diving into it headlong. Lies. Cables. Oh, it's all so crude, my boy. What should I do? Go back to England. See Helen. Give her an opportunity to call off the engagement decently. And talk to your mother, as a son should talk to her. And then, with your house in order, come back here and ask Lily to marry you. You will have the right to ask her after that. I wonder what Lily would say if I told her the truth. Well, my boy, it would be easy enough to find out. Oh, no, no, not yet. I just tell her I'm going away and that I've got a job... And heaven knows that's no lie. Hey, Pete. Yeah, what do you want, Eddie? The boss is looking for you. You better put your shoes on and get on in there. Okay, take it easy. Well, it sounds important. Sure, it's always important. Hello, Jack. You want to see me? Well, old Pete Dawes, the demon reporter. Say, why don't you wake up and notice what's going on in front of those St. Bernard eyes? What? Well, would it interest you at all on this beautiful, sunshiny day to know that the Duke of Loamshire and his son have been playing around town here for six weeks without a line of print? Well, how'd they get here? Phony names. But where were you? We run pictures of the kid when he got engaged to some English dame. 
Enter, use your eyes. Well, what am I supposed to be, Secret Service Operator Number 13? I don't know what you're supposed to be. And while you're walking around here in a trance, we have to pay a smart little hotel bellhop five bucks for the tip. Okay, where are they? They're sailing today at noon. Noon? I'll get them at the boat. Hey, wait a minute. Take these pictures and clips along so you can at least tell them from Adam. And keep your mouth shut. We're the only sheet in town that's got anything. Ha <laughs> ha, you hope. What are we supposed to do? You ought to tell a guy. I'm getting a story. You're here to get some pictures, see? Yeah, but, but who? Well, what's the difference? I'll point them out and you snap them. Try to get them with their mouths open, Eddie. It's funnier that way. With their mouths open? But gee, Pete, Ah, uh, don't be artistic. Hey, there they are, up there on the deck. Come on, Eddie. Hello, gents. I beg your pardon? Hey, what's the idea of visiting our little city without letting the papers in on it? Papers? Yeah, don't you think New York would like to know that it's been visited by the Duke of Loamshire and his son? What? what? I... Hey, all right, Eddie, snap them. Perfect, Pete, just like you said. But, my good man, you must be mistaken. Oh, not at all. How about a little statement as to why you were here, what you were doing? Look, couldn't you be a good sport and forget that you saw us? We'd appreciate it tremendously. Well, is it that important to you? We can assure you there's no significance to the visit. We simply came here to enjoy ourselves quietly. And a report of the trip in the papers might call personal embarrassment. Mm -hmm. To your fiancé, for instance, Miss Helen Fergus? Well, yes. You're still engaged, aren't you? Yes, of course. Uh, we'd be glad to make it worth your while. Oh, don't bother. If it's that important, well, as far as I'm concerned, I've never seen you. Uh, you promise that? Sure. Come on, Eddie. Thank you. Don't mention it. Hey, what do you mean, promising those guys you didn't see them? What of it? You saw them, didn't you? Sure, I got there. Oh. Pete Dawes speaking. Oh, hello, Mac. Yeah. <laughs> I thought I was swallowing myself. Say, did you see that picture of Granville with his mouth open? Was that a laugh? Hey. <laughs> well, for... Hey, I'll call you back, Mac. What are you doing here, Lily? I've got to see you alone now. Okay, we'll find an empty office. Well? Pete, this picture in the paper, did you do it? Sure, why? Did you see these people, talk to them? Of course, why all the excitement? Why? Because Lord Granville, this man engaged to a girl in England, that's Charles Gray. Charles Gray? Yes, Charles Gray, the nobody I was telling you about. Charles Gray Granville. So that's it. That's why I got the runaround. He said he was going out of town for a couple of weeks to get a job. Pete, what did he say? What did he talk about? Oh, you just... Well, go ahead. I'm asking for it. Well, he said he'd just been fooling around in America, on the quiet, and that he was going back to marry that English dame. His, his father tried to bribe me to keep the whole thing quiet. Oh, that's swell, isn't it? <laughs> well, Lizzie Gluck did all right by herself, didn't she? He was broke. A nobody. He said he loved me. Now, what did he think I was? Oh, don't get all worked up about him. If he ever comes back here, I'll break his neck. He won't come back. All right, what are you going to do about it? What can you do? I'd like to do to him what he's done to me. Make him something to laugh at. Yeah, why not? Oh, no. When you're the sap, you're the sap. Anything you do makes you even more the sap. Well, there's a story for your paper. Lord Granville walks out on poor working girl. <laughs> Can't you see the headlines? Yeah. I can see the headlines. Paper! Paper! Working girls point blue blood. Working girls point down marriage. Here you are. Here you are. What do you read, paper? Lily David says no to nobility, paper. Paper. <laughs> I want to speak to Pete Dawes. It's Miss David calling. Lily David. What? He is so in. You tell that big gorilla if he doesn't speak to me. Hello? Hello? Oh. little office girl discarded the love of Lord Charles in unshaken belief that romance would eventually be hers. Lord Charles is now returning home, his heart heavy with grief at the thought... Oh, stop it, father. Well, there you are. The latest radio bulletin. 
The captain has kept it out of the ship's paper, but it's all over England. I can't understand this. What's her idea? What's she after? A girl of her type? <laughs> You'll hear from her later, asking for money to stop further publicity. Well, I'll have to admit, she had me fooled completely. Now, we'll have to be very careful. Of course, the harm has already been done with Helen. Oh, it's a shame she was drawn into this mess. Oh, that's over. But if there are going to be reporters at Southampton waiting for you, asking for statements... I'll give them a statement. No, you won't. Oh, if I'd known I was going to drag you and Mother into cheap scandal... My boy, all we have to do is be sure that nothing is done to encourage it. If there was only some way of stopping her without resorting to the courts... Well, that won't be difficult, now that I know her language. Oh, hello, Lily. Oh, maybe I find you here. Did you? I've been waiting an hour and a half. Sit down. Yeah, thanks. Uh, the popcorn? Aren't you going to take off your shoes? <laughs> I don't know. I may not be staying very long. All right. Why? Why what? You know what. Why did you print those fake stories? Oh, that. Go ahead. Okay. I did it because I love you, and that guy Gray hurt you. And nobody's going to hurt you while I'm around and get away with it. That's what I thought. Oh, you old windmill. Well, at least nobody will ever walk out on you again. You're somebody now. Yeah, somebody is right. People pointing at me in the subway, on the street, photographers trying to break into my house. Sure, you're a celebrity now. One of those peculiar people made strangely important by ordinary newspaper print. Strangely important. A busted romance, no job. You lost your job? I didn't lose it, I quit. What for? I got tired of answering questions. And look at this. What's that, a table there? Read it. How much would it cost for a poor little working girl to forget she ever met me? Charles Gray. Well, there's a sweet boyfriend for you. Yep, sweet and to the point. Well, if he wants to be forgotten, he's the one who can do it. That's the stuff. Pete, you're a smart fellow. What do poor little working girls usually do next? Well, they usually drown themselves one way or the other. I'll take the other. Let's go. Nice joint, huh? Not classy, but it's comfortable. Hey. Oh, I'm sorry, I was thinking. Yeah, I noticed it. You know, there's one thing about Gray, Pete. He gave me the swellest moments I ever had in my life. How much will it cost for a poor little working girl to forget? Oh, all right, I'm quiet. If you ever pull another crack about that guy... Hello, Pete. Oh, hello, Nate. Where you been? I expected to see you when we had that Pip murder here last month. I'm handling ship news now, Nate. Byline and everything. Don't you read it? Nah. Ah. Oh, he's a girlfriend. Oh, Nate, I, I want you to meet Lily David. Uh, Lily, this is Nate Sarkinopoulos, the smartest cafe man in the business. Hello. How are you? Hi. Lily David, huh? Yeah, I read about you. Kicking Lord Hoosers back to England. That's what I say. Send all these foreigners back where they're supposed to be. Uh, you yeah. see, and they need how's, uh, how's business? Ah, terrible. Too many nightclubs. You haven't got something to drag them in, you starve. What I need is a first-class A number one attraction. A name. Yeah, that'd help, Nate. Sure, but where do you find them when they don't ask for a million dollars? Hey, wait a minute. Listen, Nate. I've got just the thing you're looking for. Not too expensive, but a big attraction. She'll jam the place for months. Yeah? Who is she? Lily David. What? Now, wait a minute. I'm getting out of here. Sit down. Nate, this is it. Well, maybe you're right. Listen, if you think I'm going to turn myself into a nightclub Shut queen... Shut up. I tell you, it's a cinch, Nate. Publicity, that's all it takes. Well... You'll spread her name over every billboard in town. You've read about her, you've talked about her, you've wondered about her. Now see her at the Gingham Cafe. Well, it sounds good to me. Well, it doesn't sound so good to we'll me. We've got a singing teacher for her. We'll teach her to fake a song. Oh, is that so? I can see it all now, Nate. Enlarge the place. Redecorate the whole business. Wait, that's expensive, Pete. Oh, what's the difference? Listen, well, I want to know... You'll make it all back in a couple of weeks. I tell you, she'll pack them in like sardines. Oh, Pete, for I have to say. get an orchestra. That's an idea. But... A 20 piece orchestra. Wait, no, we'll make a 20 Five pieces and draw on her voice. Oh, no, wait a minute. I can hear it now. 25 pieces swinging like mad. Oh. Who's there? Speed. Well, go jump in the lake. Hello. What do you think this dressing room is? A public thoroughfare? Say, you ought to see the crowd out there. It's packed. I told you we'd do it. They're waiting to see you, Lily David, the little office girl who thought she was Lizzie Glutt. Waiting to see me. Ha! Huh? Well, you don't have to get hysterical about it. Oh, Pete, can't you see how silly this is? Let's pretend we're sane again and call the whole thing off. No, why do that? Why? Look at me. I'm supposed to go out there and try to sing, try to dance. Dance. An outfit like this, I can't even walk. Oh, you'll come all right. Just sing your song and do your dance. That's all they all they want to do is a chance. All they want is a chance to see you. Yeah, I'd like to see you go out there in this and let them look you over. I feel like a fancy porch swing. Uh, Lily. Oh, shut up. 
Well, Lily, look, I, uh, I brought you something. See, a bracelet. A bracelet? Oh, please. Like it? It's lovely, but you shouldn't have done it. Ah, that's all right. I got a lot of other stuff, too. Here, look. A necklace, diamond earrings, a couple of brooches, an anklet, and six ruby rings. Swell, huh? Where did you get this? The whole layout cost me 15 bucks. From five feet away, nobody can tell the difference. And this is your little present to me. Now, look. We don't know where this stuff came from. There'll be rumors, of course, that this necklace was given to you by the prince of some place or other, and the earrings are a little token of steam from the Duke of Whatchamacallit. Uh-huh. And the anklet from some king of some little country. I'll work, at, work out a good gag on that. Oh, sure. Of course, we'll pay no attention to the rumors. We'll just wear our jewelry and let people talk. Sure. Say, Pete, isn't there something missing? Missing? Where's that little gadget I got from Napoleon? Well, <laughs> wouldn't be a bad idea at that. Yeah. But don't worry, I'll have your name in headlines every day. Lily David, the famous no girl, the glamour girl. I'll have you ditching everybody from a count to a rajah. Oh, could you by any chance be living my life for me? Miss David, dear waiting. Ah, she's coming. Ready, Lily? Oh, I suppose so. Oh, come on, come on, come on, buck up. You know, just to show me that everything's all right. Oh, Pete, you're such a fool. I, I don't know whether to kiss you or kick you. Well, a kiss would be easy to take, but I guess the kick would be easy to give. Oh, Pete. Man, a girl. Oh, and say, Lily, that first little bracelet I gave you, it's personal for me. It's on the level. No kidding? No kidding. Now go out there and murder them. Murder them? Do you realize you're talking to the court? <laughs> go ahead, Lily, lots of luck. Oh. Ladies and gentlemen, Lily David, the world famous no girl. Oh. Go on, go on, let your music get on me. my coat, will you, Dora? Yeah, sir. Going out, huh? Yes, why? Well, do you realize I've hardly seen you in three weeks? Gosh, I know it was my idea to have you step out now and then, It but... was your idea, all right. I must be seen in the right places with the right people, correct? Yeah, but look, I didn't mean all the time. Gosh, I feel like it's kind of lonesome sitting around talking to himself. What are you doing tonight? A date? The old guy with the 43 creameries. I suppose you forgot you've introduced me to him. Oh, can't you call it off? Just this once. You know, tell him you're sick. You, you had your throat cut or something. Why? Well. <laughs> All right. Tonight, you and I. Ah, swell. We'll go out and get some popcorn, huh? Oh, Dora. Yeah, sir? Never mind the coat. And you'll find Mr. Decker's phone number in the little book. Tell him I'm staying home tonight. That a girl. With a headache. A nice crack. <laughs> All right. What do we talk about? The weather? Well, listen, Lily. I got to talk to you seriously tonight. I. Excuse me. Yeah. Hello? Oh, hello, Mr. Randall. It's the millionaire from Yonkers. Well, hang up on him. How are you, Mr. Randall? Oh, just fine. What? Oh, Mr. Randall. Hey, what's he saying? No, I can't. No, I said I can't. You can't what? No, some other time, Mr. Randall. Oh, of course I do. Hey, give me that phone. Pete. Hello. Listen, you. Hang up that phone and don't call back again. Miss David isn't in. Huh? This is her father. The puppet's getting burned up. Well, huh? the way those mugs talk, you think they owned you. How do you think I feel about it? Do you think I asked for this? No time for myself? Working most of the night? Reporters hounding me all the time? People expecting me to do something crazy every time I step outside. Gosh, why haven't you thought of having me pushed over Niagara Falls in a kiddie car? Yeah. Well, let's drop the whole thing. Uh, it was my idea, and I'm admitting it's wrong. We, we could go away to the mountains, maybe, where you, where you could get some rest and... Then maybe we could... Oh, Lily, I know I'm just a mug, no class, not even a crease in my pants, but... Do you know what I'm trying to say? I think so. Well, how do you feel about it? Oh, P, I'd marry you in a minute if it would make either of us any happier. But something happened to me once, and I'm not going to be satisfied until I find out why. Now, are you going to let that guy bother you for the rest of your life? Pete, I can tell you this because I know you'll understand. I feel... 
like a kid must feel when someone he loves slaps him in the face. He's hurt, he's angry, but he still loves. Same old, Lily. I have to see him. Sure you do. I wonder what would happen if I took one of those London nightclub offers. Then if he really wanted to see me... You do that and he'll be camping on the doorstep. Say, how many times do I have to tell you you developed into a mighty swell dish? Pete, I'm going to London. And what's going to happen? You'll see Gray, find out in ten minutes he's still a lug and come tearing back home. At least I'd know. Right. I'm just blabbing. Sure, you go ahead and I'll sort of stay here to keep things rolling. What? You're coming along. Me? Yes, you. What do you expect to do while I'm barging around in a strange country? Stay here and write fan letters? Oh, Lily. I say you're coming with me. All right, I will. But but get this. I don't like that guy, and I never will. And if he tries to pull any more of his fancy tricks, I'll pop him right in the nose. Oh, Pete, you've got the soul of a poet. We pause for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. KNX. Los Angeles, the voice of Hollywood. In a few minutes, we resume The Gilded Lily, starring Claudette Colbert and Fred McMurray with David Niven. We left Miss Colbert rapidly gaining fame in our play as a dancer. And it's a dancer whom we hear from now. Miss Janet Riesenfeld, daughter of the distinguished conductor, Dr. Hugo Riesenfeld. I met her first as a child when she came to my office with her father, who scored many DeMille pictures. Known professionally as Raquel Rojas, Miss Riesenfeld left this summer for Spain, where she was to meet a new dancing partner. She found him in the army and herself in the midst of the fierce siege of Madrid. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Janet Riesenfeld. Thank you, Mr. DeMille. Yes, I went to Spain to dance and learned all sorts of new steps, dodging bombs and bullets. With fighting going on, Janet, how were you able to enter Madrid? I met a newspaper correspondent who had a passport, but no knowledge of Spanish. So I got through posing as his assistant. Once there, I stayed, thinking the rebellion would be over in a few days. When I changed my mind, I couldn't leave. After six terrifying weeks, the American embassy left Madrid for Valencia on Thanksgiving Day, and I went along. Did you see much actual fighting? You couldn't live in Madrid and not see it, uh, Mr. DeMille. Madrid is a city of death and ruin, but the spirit of the people is incredibly magnificent. I was only half a block away when the first rebel bomb struck. From then on, the gunfire and cannonading was ceaseless. I spent my time in Madrid dancing at benefits for soldiers, searching for food and avoiding shells. We managed to get by on a scant supply of rice, lentils, and bread. When one is in the midst of a siege, without light, warmth, or sufficient food, and with death raining down in bombs and shrapnel, one doesn't exactly look for the luxuries of life. But nonetheless, I was able to secure a few of the minor comforts during my stay in Madrid. One of these you will be especially interested in, Mr. DeMille. It was Lux toilet soap. Although I would have rather had a nice juicy steak, at least I was able to keep a whole skin and keep it clean. Hmm. I bought Lux soap in sections of the city where no other foreign product was displayed. Madrid, of course, had no hot water, but that didn't bother, bother Lux toilet soap very much. I found it lathered just as beautifully in cold water. Are the reports true that women are fighting with their men at the front? Yes. They're just as heroic and brave as their soldiers, but principally they have taken over the civilian work of the men. Being an American, nothing moved me as much as when the word came that President Roosevelt had been re-elected. In the midst of all the suffering and bloodshed, Madrid welcomed that news enthusiastically. President Roosevelt's picture appeared everywhere, and I soon realized that next to their own, our flag is closest to the hearts of the Madrilenos. The hardship of my few months were nothing compared to the suffering of the Spanish people. More than anything else, the experience has made me grateful that I'm an American. Thanks and good night. Good night, Miss Riesenfeld. <laughs> Once again, Claudette Colbert, Fred McMurray, and David Niven in The Gilded Lily. A figure of international reputation, Lily went to London, where she quickly became the toast of Mayfair. 
She's been seeing Lord Granville regularly for almost a month. And Pete is convinced that his own case is quite hopeless. It's 11 o'clock in the morning as he knocks at the door of Lily's hotel suite. Come in. Oh, Pete. Hello. You almost missed me. I was just going out. With uh, Granville? I, I was going to leave word downstairs that I'd be back tonight. You didn't mention it yesterday. It was just a little trip into the country for a rest. This is Sunday, you know, and I don't work tonight. Yeah. Say, uh, Lily, I, I just dropped in to tell you I'm sailing today. Sailing? Why? Well, I can't express it exactly. But you've been going right along so swell, and I seem to be in the way more and more. That's not true. Oh, it is true. I, I'm just something you needed when everything was new to you. Can't you see that, well, that you've reached a point where I can't help you anymore, where the best thing for both of us is for me to bow out in a hurry? Pete, I can't stay here without you. What about Gray? Don't you intend to keep on seeing him? Yes, but... You know what's going to happen. I know. He seems to be a nice guy, and he's crazy about you. And all I want you to be married to him. That's what's in your heart, isn't it? Honestly? Yes. Well, it's all great with me. I'm glad to see you get what you wanted. And now that my job's finished, I'm going home. Well, if you've decided on going back, I can't stop you. Pete, have I hurt you? No. I'm the one that should be asking that. You'll never be sore, will you, Lily, about the crazy way I shoved you into this racket? No, of course not. You know now that it's made certain things possible. Things that couldn't have happened any other way. I guess it did. Oh, Pete, couldn't you please stay? I'll get my old job back and everything will be Jake. And every Thursday night I'll show up at the bench and eat a bag of popcorn for both of us. Just for a gag, sort of. But you're leaving so suddenly. And look, if things don't go so well with you. Oh, but they will. I, I know they will. Goodbye, Lily. Pete. So long. Like it? Oh, it's heavenly. I'd almost forgotten what the country was like. And now this place. I can understand what that old innkeeper meant now. And hey, what was that? Didn't you hear him? Oh, yes, something about this being the very place where his wife said she'd marry him. That was it, wasn't it? Yes, 30 years ago, right here. <laughs> He's a queer old bird. It must be very funny, really. Oh, I'd love to have seen them. Hugo and Lizzie Glutz. Glutz? Who told you that was her name? It had to be. I'll bet she sat right here where I'm sitting. And Hugo stood up, of course, because he had on his Sunday pants. <laughs> it's rather pathetic, isn't it? Look, there he is now with his broom and the drudgery that he hates, and that little girl aging into a bitter old woman. I don't feel that way about them. You have everything that matters when you're just Hugo and Lizzie Glutt, two happy nobodies. Well, you wouldn't be able to stand that sort of existence for long. It's what I've wanted all my life. Great. What possible pleasure is there in parading ourselves before a crowd, as though we're trying to let the whole world see that we're actually in love? Well, is it so terrible that I'm proud of you? Lily, do you realize what's happened to you? You're known all over the world. Men everywhere have talked about you and wanted you. Now all those people have laughed at me when they thought I'd lost you. Now they're going to see that you belong to me, that you always did belong to me. Gray. Yes, what is it, Lily? Oh, nothing. Nothing. Hey, buddy. Yeah? This bench private? No, sit down. Thanks. Can you spare a cigarette, buddy? Yeah, here you are. Thanks. Ah. Oh. What's the matter? It ain't my brand. <laughs> it's too bad. Yeah, but it'll do. That's the worst of being broke. You can never get your own brand. Here you are, baby. No girl may say yes. No girl may say yes. No girl may say yes. Boy, that gal come up from nowhere. I wonder how much dough the Englishman's got. Mm, she doesn't care. No? How do you figure? Oh, it's just my guess. Well, maybe so, but a couple of million bucks would come in handy for a cold winter. Two million bucks or two cents. Doesn't make any difference to that girl. She's got an idea in the back of her head about what the perfect life should be. And she's not going to stop hunting until she finds it. Yeah? I suppose you got all this straight from her. You're darn right. And she was sitting right here on this bench. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> Say, um, you, you ain't Napoleon, are you? No. Are you? Me? No, I ain't. I think I'll be going. Hey, wait a minute. How do you mail a bag of popcorn? Yeah. 
<laughs> I don't know. Ask your keeper. Popcorn. All the way from America. <laughs> Look like Mr. Pete's on another tail. No, he knows what he's doing. Mm, he a card with it, honey. Listen. I just remembered how tough it is to get popcorn in London. Have you and Gray found a bench yet? Now, what do you mean by that, Miss Lily? <laughs> oh, funny face. Can't you see him, Dora? Draped all over that bench, his shoes off, that popcorn <laughs> bag in his hand. <laughs> you know, Pete never would touch peanuts. No, he says peanut eaters don't know how to relax. Well, excuse me, Miss Lily, but it wouldn't hurt you none to sort of... Well, rest up. Mm, don't I know it. Oh, now, honey, couldn't you stay in this afternoon? Lord Granville probably has something planned. But working six nights a week at the club and never in a single day? <laughs> well, if Mr. Pete was here, he'd sure put a stop to it, he would. Never mind, Dora. Yes, yeah, sir. I'll answer it. Yes, yeah, sir. Hello. Hello, Gray. Right on the hour. That's right. Well, no kiss? What's the matter, Lily? I'm tired, that's all. Gray, you haven't anything arranged for this afternoon, have you? Oh, nothing much. Just tea at the Clydes. You'll have to know them sooner or later. I have to know them. How many more hundreds of people must I meet before... Before what? Oh, nothing. I had no idea my friends were annoying to you. Gray, listen, we'll have to decide something right now. I came to England because I loved you and because I thought that you still loved me. But something's wrong. Something... Have you ever forgiven me for what happened in America? I told you I was as much to blame as you. Then why can't we be satisfied with each other? Why do you insist that we spend day and night putting ourselves on display? Is that the only thrill you get out of being with me? Oh, I've been selfish, I know, but... Why don't you take a week from the nightclub? It could be arranged. And you remember that little inn, Hugo's? We could spend the week there. A week at the inn? Then what? Well, I... Back to London as though we had never been away, is that it? Well, Lily, you make it sound so, so... <sighs> Shall I answer it? Lily. Yes? Who? Photographers from the American Syndicate. Photographers? Give me that phone. Lily, you don't want... Hello. Hello, send them right up. But we don't want to see them here. I'll handle this. You just entertain them until I'm ready. But this isn't exactly the place. Lily, Lily, come out here. Lily, listen to me. Show the world, didn't you? All right, we will. Lily, come out. All right, come on. How do you do, Mr. David? How do you do, sir? Set up the cameras, boys. Where's my flash bulb? Why, gentlemen, what? Uh, we're the photographers, Lord Granville. I'll get one here first, a fireplace shot. What's the meaning of this? These... Uh, we have to be prepared, you know. In case of a surprise wedding, our papers will already have honeymoon pictures. <laughs> well, haven't I anything to say about that? Sure you have. Lily. You can make your statement after I make mine. What are you doing with that grip? Get your cameras ready, boys. For oh, heaven's right sake, Lily. So you've been playing around with a celebrity. Okay, I'll show you how the celebrity racket is really works. The way Pete taught me. No matter what you do, surprise them. Lily, don't. I'll admit I was wrong. You but... bet you were. Boys, the whole thing's off. What? I'm walking out. Yeah, here's a swell picture for you. Grip in hand by the open door. Come on, snap it. Hold it, hold it. Hold it. Hold it. Hold it. <laughs> That's Thank you, Lily, wait. Right, Tell we'll your papers I'm going home to sit on a bench and eat popcorn. What else? Maybe he'll show up, maybe he won't. But if he does, I'm going to sit back and watch the world go by with the greatest mug on earth. Oh, oh, boy. Boy. Oh, 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 will you? Come on. Oh, Are you sure you didn't see a man here? He'd, he'd be waiting right at this bench. Oh, oh, listen, lady. I've seen lots of men here. Right up there's the public library. Men go in and out all the day and half the night. I can't remember all of them. Now, go in. Let me sleep. Listen, he's tall, see? About that high with big feet and a bag of popcorn. Oh, now, try to think. You know, there's something funny about this bench. It's haunted by crackpots. Oh, well, I'll go away. No, I won't. I've got as much right here as you. What time is it, do you know? I said, what time is it? Hello, Lily. <gasps> oh, Pete. I, I tried to catch you at the boat, but I missed it. Oh. Here, you're looking swell. Oh, Pete, I'm so glad to see you. If you ever get away from me again. Say, what goes on here? Oh, I don't know. All the way across the Atlantic, and I find that on our bench. <laughs> 
Oh, I know him. What? Hey, you, wake up. Uh, you remember uh, me? Oh, yeah. I want you to meet the girlfriend, Lily David. Lily David? Boo! Oh, oh, let me out of here, <laughs> let me out of here. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I got some popcorn. So I see. You want to sit down? All right. Have some, Lily? Thanks. Ah, you know, this is what I call living. Yes, they're just sitting tight and watching the world go by. Is that all? Oh, what else is there? Can't you guess? Yeah, but I'm afraid to say oh, it. Oh, Pete, you old mug. Take off your shoes and kiss me. From Claudette Colbert and Fred McMurray, <clears throat> we'll hear again a little later. Our hero tonight was a newspaper man. So I thought I'd ask one of the most famous reporters in the world, Mr. Linton Wells, to be our guest. His record reads like a page of Richard Harding Davis fiction. During 20 years in foreign fields, he's been war correspondent in Mexico, China, Asia Minor, Siberia, Morocco, Syria, Nicaragua, and more recently, Ethiopia. He was a lieutenant in the Chinese Army and a major in the Mexican Army, a colonel in the Nicaraguan Air Forces, and holds decorations from 12 foreign governments. He's in Hollywood now, completing his autobiography, Blood on the Moon, and recuperating from wounds and illness acquired in Ethiopia while correspondent for the New York Herald Tribune. Ladies and gentlemen, Linton Wells. Thank you, Mr. DeMille. You know, the last time I encountered you and Claudette Colbert was in Cairo, Egypt. Indirectly, of course. There in the shadow of the pyramids, I went to the movies and saw your production of Cleopatra. <laughs> Tell me the worst. What did the Egyptians think of the way I handled their history? Well, I heard a couple of dark-skinned natives wishing Cleopatra were running Egypt again, Colbert fashion. <laughs> you know, e Egypt's certainly movie-conscious. In Cairo, all society turns out one night each week and goes to the cinema. It's a ceremonial occasion with a display of evening dress and jewelry rivaling an opening of the Metropolitan Opera. Well, you've seen pictures in about every corner in the world, Linton. How do other countries like Hollywood? Well, the stars, Charlie Chaplin, being human in any language, is most universally beloved. I've seen his antics roared at by the nose-pierced savages of the Belgian Congo, by Chinese and the Indians of the Peruvian Andes. Next in line, there's Mickey Mouse, just as popular in Brazil, Manchu Kuo, and Finland as he is here. All the world loves American musicals. And believe me, there's nothing so strange as hearing a native singing a hot cha tune in the depths of fever-ridden jungle. <laughs> but I've heard it. In French East Africa, you go to the movies in the open air and are bitten to death by mosquitoes or drenched by a sudden torrent of rain. A huge native who ran a projection machine there wore a charm given him by the local medicine man as a guarantee to prevent the film from breaking. And in Japan, where most kissing sequences are cut out, the picture is explained by an interlocutor as the mood strikes him. I read your war dispatches from Ethiopia and noticed you occasionally had time to see a movie. Yes, in Addis Ababa, there were three ramshackle theaters infested with fleas and ancient pictures. The natives were enthusiastic over American films, though, and I saw them roll in the aisles of the Laurel and Hardy comedy while their friends were fighting only a few miles away. By the way, my wife, who's also a reporter for the Herald Tribune, went with me to Ethiopia and insisted on taking her case of Lux toilet soap along. A thoughtful woman. <laughs> That's what we figured out until we got there. You can believe this or not, Mr. DeMille, but after bringing that soap from New York to Egypt from Egypt to French Somaliland, and then 500 miles inland by rail at 14 cents a pound, after worrying about carriers and customs collectors, I saw five different shops in Addis Ababa selling Lux toilet soap and charging much less for it than I paid for transportation costs alone. And I said then what I'm saying now. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, Linden Wells. Since starring on the Lux Radio Theater last summer, Claudette Colbert has observed her first wedding anniversary with Dr. Joel Pressman. 
established a lovely new home in Brentwood, and made what will undoubtedly prove another hit film, Made of Salem. Fred McMurray, not to be outdone, has completed Champagne Waltz, is co-starring in Made of Salem, and has taken to himself a wife. But from this point on, they'll have to report for themselves. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Claudette Colbert and Fred McMurray. Mr. DeMille, after nearly an hour on the air, I'm afraid I'm all talked out. However, I do want to thank you again for the top productions you give us every Monday night. And before I go, just a word of praise for the product responsible for this program. I could say many fine things about it, but the best indication of what I think of Lux Toilet Soap is the fact that I've used nothing else for years. All right, Fred, your turn. Oh, thanks, Claudette. Uh, I had hopes of being neatly left out of this, Mr. DeMille. <laughs> You and Claudette know me well enough to realize that I'm not one to get up in front of the microphone and make clever speeches. Well, then don't say anything. Oh, thanks. That suits me fine. Now, just a minute, just a minute. Don't go, either. <laughs> I've heard a lot of music coming from the sets of your two pictures, Made of Salem and Champagne Waltz. Since you'd rather not talk, suppose you sing. <laughs> I thought you were a friend of mine. <laughs> well, since I'm on a spot, I'll, I'll try a chorus of a tune from the picture, Champagne Waltz. The name of it is called, uh, When is a Kiss, Not a Kiss. a kiss, not a kiss, whenever I'm not kissing you, when my two arms are missing you, nothing means a thing I do, when it's not concerning you, when is a hug, not a hug, whenever I'm not hugging you. If you'd allow me to always tag about Then I'd have something that I could brag about When is a kiss not a kiss When I can't do my kissing with you Thank you, Fred. Thank you. That was splendid. <laughs> Good night. Good night to both of you. Thank you, Miss Colbert and Mr. McMurray. This is your announcer, ladies and gentlemen, Melville Ruick. The Lux Radio Theater program for next Monday night will be told shortly by Mr. DeMille. In our cast tonight were George Chandler as Eddie, C. Montague Shaw as the Duke of Loneshire, Chester Clute as the editor, John Gibson as the bum, Georgia Simmons as Dora, Lou Merrill as Nate, Frank Nelson as the man, William Royal as subway guard, Mary Arden as the woman, and Warren McCollum and Ross Forrester as newspaper reporters and newsboys. Miss Colbert, Mr. McMurray, and Mr. DeMille appeared through courtesy of Paramount Studios. Mr. Niven through Samuel Goldwyn. Mr. Niven is now working in the universal picture, We Have Our Moments. And Louis Silver's 20th Century Fox, where he was in charge of music for the new film, One in a Million. And now, Mr. DeMille. To the Lux Radio Theater, next Monday night, comes one of the most accomplished actors the screen has won from the stage, Edward G. Robinson. With him, Beverly Roberts and Paul Guilfoyle. Recently returned to Hollywood from abroad, Mr. Robinson stars for us as Warden Brady in Martin Flavin's tense melodrama, Criminal Code. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Edward G. Robinson, Paul Guilfoyle, and Beverly Roberts in Criminal Code. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>